I'm Glenn Stone. I'm an environmental anthropologist at Washington University in St. Louis, and I study the issues of the day concerning food and agriculture. One of my areas of research these days is GMOs, genetically modified crops and foods. A really interesting topic for anthropologists to study because of the wide range of issues that they raise. We hear a lot of partisan rhetoric these days that tries to narrow GMOs down to something really simple. We hear, for instance, that this is just another form of crop improvement, that it's just sort of like domestication 2.0 and that it's simple. But I don't think it is simple. And one of the things that I try to do in my work is to rather than narrow the conversation, broaden the conversation. So golden rice is a great example. This is something that I've been doing research on. This is probably the most intensely debated GM crop in the world. And it's sometimes cited as a sort of a silver bullet vitamin tablet for kids worldwide who are vitamin A deficient. People who are skeptics of the technology are sometimes called mass murderers. But it is not that simple at all. Golden rice is not just a vitamin tablet. It is rice, which is probably the most culturally freighted crop in the world especially in the Philippines, which is the main country where golden rice is being developed. The Philippines has got a really distinctive history when it comes to rice and also a very contested present. I think there are three different visions of rice that we get in the Philippines, and they differ according to how they relate to place. So the first of these visions is the Green Revolution vision. Uh, the Philippines is where the rice half of the Green Revolution occurred. Uh, Green Revolution rices were bred at IRI, that's the International Rice Research Institute, south of Manila, and they were basically designed to be placeless, to be able to grow anywhere as long as they were in fields that had lots of irrigation and lots of chemicals. It's not entirely clear how much the Green Revolution rices really raised production, but they did accomplish one of their main goals, which was to shove out thousands of locally adapted varieties of rice or land races. But it didn't shove out all of those local varieties and they are in fact the basis of the second vision of rice. They're being grown still in the mountains and the spectacular terraces of central Luzon. They're called heirloom rice now and they are sold in Manila and they're being exported to North America. Heirloom rice production doesn't take anything away from Green Revolution rice production, which is grown on a much larger scale, but it does challenge the Green Revolution's view of placelessness, and the heirloom rice producers stress the importance of place and the terraces and the people who grow it. Ironically, Erie, the people who bred Green Revolution rice, are now heavily involved in promoting the heirloom rices in central Luzon. The third vision of rice is based on golden rice. This is the idea of rice as a vitamin tablet. Golden rice has got all the placelessness of the Green Revolution rice, and in fact, the golden trade is being put into Green Revolution varieties. But apart from that placelessness, it's also genetically placeless, as golden rice has had at one point or another genes put into it that come from corn, from daffodil, from bacteria, and from viruses. Golden rice still doesn't grow very well in test plots, and we still don't really know if it raises vitamin A levels in badly undernourished kids. And it continues to be important to look at it really broadly, I think. And so of the different areas of the world that my students and I are looking at GMO issues, which includes India and the US, um, the Philippines continues to be one of the most fascinating. <laughs>